Okay. Hello. Uh, dear colleagues and friends, thank you all for being, for being here both in uh, person as virtually. We are very happy that in the framework of the new activities of the NIA Library, we have the first book presentation and uh, it's the first of the events that we will have this uh, new academic year. Uh, in NIA, we have organized several wonderful events. So if you want, you can join us also to these events that will follow. We also want to warmly thank the author Nick and Smith for, being, for accepting our invitation and for presenting her book here with us today. Now, a few words about uh, the author. Ninkin Smith studied classical languages and culture at Leiden University. She taught Greek, Latin, and classics in translation at Drew University in Madison, USA for several years. Once moved back to the Netherlands, she taught Greek and Latin in several high schools until retirement in 2019. In the fall of 2024, her second novel, The Syric Princess, will appear with Primavera Verse. The subject of the novel is Julia Domna, wife of the Emperor Septimius Severus, second century. And we wish her good luck with her new book, and we give her the floor in order to take us along in the wonderful journey. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you so much, Sotiria. And thank you, everybody at the Netherlands Institute in Athens, because you have uh, welcomed me so, so nicely. I had to think of a word that I learned in high school when we were learning Greek, which is the word xenos. And we learned xenos is a friend, a guest friend. And we thought, what is a guest friend? We know what a friend is, but a guest friend we didn't know about in Holland in the 60s. But now I definitely know what a guest friend is, because I'm experiencing this uh, Xenia here uh, very much. Thank you all very much. And um, I must also thank Anne Brisbart for inviting me in the first place to give a talk on a novel that has been around already for a couple of years. Now, what makes it um, sort of new again is that this novel has now been published in French. I talked to some people here in the audience and they asked me about the English translation, but it doesn't work that way in the country of the publishers. Uh, so let's hope it, it will, um, uh, I will do it one day, I will get it done and get an English translation also. But so far I can only help you with a Dutch book and a French one. So let's get to the book. Um, here we have um, the, both the versions that I was talking about. Um, and uh, I'm, I'm talking in English uh, since that is the common language that we all sort of speak and understand. Why um, a French translation? Well, it, it makes sense when you think of Marguerite Jursenaar. Marguerite Jursenaar uh, published in 1951, a very famous book. I see some recognition here in some eyes. It was called La Mémoire d'Adrien, The Memories of Hadrian. And um, this Hadrian, by the way, was the emperor, the Roman emperor who ruled from 117 till 138. So when we are talking Sabina, we're talking early second century. Now, the French author, Yursenaar, and if you are not familiar with her, please read her after you finished Sabina. She was a very conscientious author. Uh, she reflected a lot on her writing. She added such reflections as an attachment to her work. And she asks a question uh, in those reflections. She says, well, why actually Hadrian? Why not a woman, for instance, Plotina? Plotina was the wife of Hadrian's predecessor, Trajan. Apparently, Jursenaar did not even contemplate Sabina. She said, why not Plotima? She didn't say, why not Sabina? 
Um, her answer to the question, why Hadrian, why not a woman, was the following. She considered it to be impossible for, quote, the lives of women are too limited, too much hidden. Let a woman speak. And the first reproach she will get is that she's no longer a woman. It is hard enough to lay any veracity in the mouth of a man, unquote. This observation, these words, show how the interests and views of scholars, of writers of novels, and of course of the general reader have changed. Who in this day and age would challenge the idea that it can be interesting to imagine what the lives of women in the ancient world have been like. In the past decades, the women of Greek and Roman antiquity, whether mythical or historical, through their interpreters among writers and scholars, are claiming and receiving their space in the canon of historical and mythological personalities. And so Sabina's story came to be told, and Hadrian has gotten a counterpart in Gallimard's literary pantheon. I could have started my project of writing a book on Sabina by reading your Senar again, but I purposely did not. I was 18 when I read her memoirs of Hadrian for the first time, and almost 40 years later, I decided to give Sabina the floor. I did not reread your Senar because I did not want to be intimidated by this great author. I did reread her, meanwhile, in the spring, though, this past spring. So I did my own research and constructed my own plot. Research because such a plot, of course, must, in my opinion, be based on solid facts. Data which give us something to go on. So let's have a look at what we have in terms of solid facts. While it is easy to find information on Hadrian, it is, of course, much harder to find facts on Sabina. For the facts, we have the archaeological sources, coins and inscriptions and works of art. In the ancient literature, where we classicists tend to look first, we only find a few comments. Let's briefly have a look at these comments. A fifth century handbook on the Caesars, um, where the author claims that Sabina, quote, I'm, I'm using somebody's uh, translation, obviously, in English, um, used to boast openly that she had taken steps to make sure she did not become pregnant by him. Offspring, of course, offspring of his would harm the human race, unquote. So that kind of a woman was Sabina to say such things about her man. Another late histor historical source, the Historia Augusta from the fourth century, um, writes, and now I quote again, Hadrian removed from office Septicius Clarus, the prefect of the guard, and Suetonius Tranquillus, the imperial secretary, and many others besides. Because without his being Hadrian, without Hadrian's consent, they had been conducting themselves toward his wife, Sabina, in a more informal fashion than the etiquette of the court demanded. And as he himself, he being Hadrian, was wont to say, he would have sent away his wife too, on the ground of ill temper and irritability, had he merely been a private citizen. He called her aspera and morosa in Latin. So no flattering words about the empress. Modern scholars, in turn, are not very flattering about the historical value of these two classical authors or, or these two works, the, the ones I just quoted. There is a general agreement that the historians of the later empire were of senatorial rank and therefore, in principle, hostile towards the emperor himself. And they would be even more hostile towards his consort, his wife. It was these historians' favorite pastime to portray the empress as totally unrestrained, any empress, by the way, because um, such conduct reflected badly on the hated emperor. 
A man who could not restrain his wife was hardly a man at all. So what should I do with the few passages in all? There are three quotes in Roman literature that are about Sabina. Uh, well, I shamelessly used them for my own means. For they provided, of course, some juicy material. Yet they are putting my Sabina in a bad frame, don't they? At some point, while I was working on my novel, the British scholar Anthony Everett came to Leiden, where I live, and he gave a lecture, and he has written several monographies on Roman emperors. One of these, Hadrian. After his lecture, this, the subject this time was the Emperor Augustus, I went up to him and I said, I am using your monography on Hadrian extensively because I'm writing a novel on Sabina. And I saw his eyes light up, and with a smile he said, that's great, are you gonna make her nice? <laughs> and yes, I was gonna make her nice. I wasn't going to spend years of my life on a not nice person. Historical fiction is a wonderful genre. So I used them, the handbook on the Caesars and the Historia Augusta, but I used them to fit my story. This story I will tell you in a little while. But first, a bit more about the sources that I used for the facts. Coins are important, of course. They were an important vehicle for imperial propaganda. The emperor and his concert are portrayed all the time. But we not only get to know their uh, faces from coins. We also, <clears throat> excuse me, we also get to know the norms and values which the emperor wants to spread. And for this, his wife comes in handy. As the emperor is important to the people, like a father, like the highest Roman god Jupiter, so is the emperor's wife likened to Jupiter's concert, Juno. The concert wife, Sabina, is the symbol of what his reign stands for. Virtues like unity, concordia, and pudicitia, wifely or womanly modesty. Not exactly the virtues the Roman historians highlighted in Sabina, but apparently the image the emperor wanted. An emperor, by the way, who in many aspects tried to imitate his predecessor, Augustus, the man who tried to restore old values among which Pudicitia was prominent. There were statues and portraits of Sabina, of course. What does a statue tell us? We have this remarkable one, which is found in Ostia, Italy, the port town of um, Rome. Remarkable because to us, this wet t-shirt statue may not exactly be the epitome of pudicitia, of modesty. But if you consider that Venus Genetrix is the matriarch of Rome, Venus, the mother of Aeneas, the hero who traveled from Troy to Italy and became, through his offspring, the founding father of Rome, and when you consider the statues of Venus were normally naked, you may agree that this statue is modest enough. So, Sabina, the woman who never became a mother herself, is portrait, portrayed as the founding mother of Rome. Isn't there some irony here? What would she herself have thought of this statue? We will get back to the primary sources a little later, such as inscriptions. But at this point, you must be eager to hear more about Sabina. So let me tell you about the familial relationship between Hadrian and Sabina. For in fact, Sabina was a second cousin to Hadrian. We see two genealogies. To the left, we see the Aili, the family of Hadrian. Um, uh, Hadrian is a third generation Italian. He is of senatorial rank and his family owns an amphora business in Spain. Uh, because that's where the family has its roots. 
He has a sister, Paulina. I was going to point this out a little bit. So here we have Hadrian. Uh, here we have his sister, Paulina, who is married to Servianus. And they have a daughter, again, Paulina. And this daughter has a son who fell off the sheet, unfortunately. And he is important. His name is Fuscus. You can maybe still read the name of his father, Fuscus. Fuscus um, is uh, the grand cousin of Hadrianus, of Hadrian. Now, uh, back to Servianus. He is an important Roman general and a lifelong rival of his brother-in-law, Hadrian, when it comes to career planning. The two are at war amongst themselves for most of their lives. But Paulina and Servianus have a daughter, as I already told you, Paulina. And through her, they have a grandson, Fuscus. And Fuscus plays a key role in our plot. He is, in my book at least, the intended successor of Hadrian, who himself will remain childless. So let's turn to the other side, to the LPE now of whom the Emperor Trajan is the prominent shoot on the tree. Here we have Hadrian, uh, Trajan, pardon. Trajan uh, the LP also have uh, roots in Spain uh, and Trajan married with Plotina remi remains childless. His sister Marciana, however, will be the mother of Matidia and through her, the grandmother of Sabina. So Sabina is Trajan's great niece. And it is often claimed that the Empress Plotina was the instigator of the marriage of her great niece to Hadrian, Hadrian being a fav favorite of hers. Likewise, Matidia, if you can still follow, Sabidia's mother seems to have had a special relationship with her later son-in-law. On Hadrian's estate in Tibur, the Villa Adriana, an inscription has been found with a funerary speech by Hadrian for his mother-in-law, Matidia, which shows that he was fond of her. Also, in the same text, Hadrian refers to Sabina as Mea Sabina, which definitely has an affectionate ring to it. Let me tell you a bit about the book, a bit about the plot. The story of the empress and the empress, excuse me, the story of the empress, the emperor, and the boy Antinous. So we could well say there were three in this marriage. But mostly it is, of course, all about the empress. The novel begins and ends at the Villa Hadriana the large estate which Hadrian had built in Tibur near Rome. The story itself starts near the end. The emperor is old and ill and morose, and the 53-year-old empress feels isolated and lonely. Hardly any news reaches her from the city any longer until a rumor comes that her nephew Fuscus, the intended successor, is in Rome and in danger. Now, Sabina has the help of a young man and a young woman, a set of twins who were enslaved since infancy. They help their mistress escape from the villa, and together the three of them travel to Rome incognito. Sabina has reasons to believe Fuscus has fallen from grace, and his life is in danger. During the days of her escape, Sabina crosses the city. She meets old friends such as her brother-in-law, Servianus, her sister, Mindia, her personal physician. And she also meets new friends, people who help her on her search, such as a poor family in the Subura, the slums of Rome, as well as a Christian lady and a baker and his wife, all of whom help to help her to stay out of the hands of the pursuing imperial guards. While she is in search of and finally finds Fuscus, but 
alas, not in a place and a state she had hoped for. During this intricate journey, she looks back on her life and the reader gets to know the Empress. Not only the Empress with her trials and tribulations of that moment, but also of her childhood. The little bookish girl, the apple of her father's eye, her engagement to Hadrian and their marital life. The neglected spouse and yet faithful companion on all his travels. We are getting a portrait of a marriage. We become acquainted with the people with whom during her life she strikes up important friendships such as with the Romanized Eastern princess, Julia Balbilla. All of the names I just mentioned, by the way, are historical figures. Through all of this run some intriguing questions. What has happened to Fuscus? Who will really succeed the ill emperor when he dies? What happened to Antinous in Egypt? The Egypt episode is a chapter that comes as a flashback. <clears throat> what was Suetonius' role? Suetonius, whom we know as a biographer of emperors and who was Hadrian's secretary and who became the object of malicious gossip. gossip. Of course, I can't give you the answers to these questions because I'm not going to spoil the plot. The title of my talk promises I will take you to Athens, and I will. But first, we need to travel to Egypt, because we also need to talk a bit about the boy Antinous. As I said, and by the way, what you see on the background is a part of the Nile mosaic in Palestrina in uh, Italy. You may know it, it's a huge mosaic with all sorts of um, pictures of what happened on the Nile. And this is a man in a small papyrus boat. Um, and it seems like he's uh, carrying lotus flowers. And then in the upper corner, you may recognize him, is an Egyptianized um, portrait of Antinous. After his death, he became a god. And he was often portrayed like an Egyptian pharaoh. And to the left, I need not say much about his uh, statue on the left, I think. As I said, with her husband, Sabina traveled the ancient world. One of their trips brings them to Egypt. It is the year 130 AD. Among the people of the large imperial retinue, we find this beautiful person, a boy on the brink of manhood, maybe already a little too far over the brink the lover boy of the emperor, Antinous. Possibly the most famous beautiful boy in history. Just as famous is the story of his sudden death in the river Nile. What happened? Nobody knows. There are serious books and articles full of speculation and possible scenarios. The above mentioned British historian, Anthony Everett, wrote in his monography on Hadrian, when he came to the episode of Antinous mysterious death, quote, it may be fruitless to speculate when the truth can never be revealed, unless perhaps by the author of an historic novel, unquote. So yes, my book on Sabina will put you out of your misery and in it the, tru the truth is revealed. While in Egypt, there is another prominent figure in the company of the royals. In this picture, you see the remnants of one of two colossal statues near Luxor, at the other side of the Nile. As happens with tourist attractions, already in Roman times, this colossal statue of an ancient Egyptian pharaoh is connected to a famous anecdote. The ruinous statue is called Memnon, after the mythical son of Eos, the goddess of dawn. Every morning, when the first rays of the sun strike the ruined statue, it gives out a sound. As if someone plucks the, the strings of a lyre. And at this time of day, tourists flock around the statue, hoping to hear that mythical sound. 
That is, such was the case in the days of Hadrian. Unfortunately, the statue has been restored later on by the emperor Septimius Severus, after which the phenomenon of the mysterious stone disappeared. As in antiquity the statue was famous for this phenomenon, in later time it became famous for different reasons. Look at those legs, those huge legs. They are covered, covered with graffiti. And here we see a drawing of the left leg and a detail of an inscription on the lower part of the leg. And of course we can't see the details, but I, you must believe me when I say that it's about these words. Actually, this text is what we see here. And here we see a name, Julia Balbilla. And two lines down, we see a sigma alpha, the beginning of the name Sabina. So all I, I'm trying to do is convince you that those two names are there written in a poem on the leg. Humankind changes little over the course of history. As today's tourists love to write their names on the objects they visit, so did the ancients. So did Lord Byron in the Temple of Poseidon on Cape Sunion, and so did Sabina in Egypt. Among these inscriptions that uh, you see on the picture are four famous poems in ancient Greek lyrical verse which commemorate the visit of Sabina and Hadrian. And the author of the poems is known, for she mentions herself, as I told you already, her name is Julia Balbilla. And by using a style and meter that imitates the poetry of the archaic Greek poetess Sappho, who lived almost seven centuries before her, Julia Balbilla proves to be a learned woman and an accomplished poetess. The poems tell us how the beautiful Empress Sabina has come to visit Memnon and how the statue, out of desire to see the Empress a second time, does not give a sound out the first time. The royal couple has to come back the next morning and yes, then the mythical Memnon greets them with the mysterious sound. So from these inscriptions, we know for sure that Sabina visited Egypt in 130 AD and that this Julia Balbilla was in her company. And Julia Balbilla is not a totally unknown person in Roman history. In fact, it is this Julia Balbilla who will now bring us to Athens and 18 years back in time to the year 112. Well, you may recognize the picture to the left if you are from Athens. For us, the year 112, but for the Athenians, it used to be the year of the Archonte Aelius Hadrianus. Hadrian is 36 years old at this point and has been married to Sabina for about 12 years. Hadrian's career is flourishing. In fact, he has already occupied the highest office, that of the consulate. He has just served time as a military general along the borders of the Danube. And now the Emperor Trajan has given him a leave of absence to spend a year in Athens. Spending time in Athens used to be part of the education of the Roman elite, the Roman male elite, I should say. A total immersion in Athens was intended to polish the rough edges of a military and basic Roman rhetorical training. By visiting the classrooms of the Greek philosophers, Roman nobility could brush up on their Greek, learn more about Greek history and culture, study architecture, read literary works by the Greeks. Greece was to Romans what Europe is, or maybe used to be, to the Americans, or what the 19th century Italiani Sarraise would be to the people of the northern countries. So to Athens they went, Sabina and Hadrian. And to them it must have seemed like a long leisurely holiday. 
And as men do on holidays, they stop shaving and grow a beard. So Hadrian stopped shaving. Even Hadrian's beard, by the way, has led to a debate among scholars. Was it an attempt to emulate the Greek philosophers? Or was it meant to cover up a scar on his chin? Again, my novel puts an end to all speculation. And this one I'll give you. The highly cultivated Sabina was the one who encouraged him to look a bit more Greekish. In Athens, the couple is received with all due respect. They are lodging with a family of royal blood well-known clients of Rome, Gaius, Julius, Antiochus, Epiphanes, Philopapos, that's one name, the brother of Julia Balbilla, the poetess who later in Egypt clearly is an intimate friend of the Empress Sabina. And now um, to underline the importance of my being here in Athens, I just visited for the first time uh, this monument a few days ago and uh, so it is a token of my appreciation so this is uh, again the monument the tomb of Philopapos um, good so the the Hadrian and Sabina Sabina are uh, staying with Philopapos and um, brother and sister Philopapus and Julia and uh, Julia Balbilla stem from a royal family from a former kingdom in the east, Komagin, uh, which would now be southern Turkey, northern Syria, at this time a client state of Rome. In Athens, the former consul Hadrian receives the title of Archont, and that's why the, the year was called after him. The main archant uh, was the name giver of the year. Um, and he becomes an honored and high ranking citizen of Athens. He is given a special task organizing the annual procession for the goddess Athena. You only have to think back of your last visit to the stunning Acropolis Museum, and you know what procession I'm talking about. And we can imagine how honorable Hadrian's position in Athens might have been. So our imperial couple is staying with Philopapos and Julia Balbilla in my book. Whether Julia Balbilla actually lived in Athens at that time, we don't know, because we know that she probably grew up in Rome. But of Philopapos, we know that he was Hadrian's host. We know it, and we know he was a prominent Athenian citizen. And this famous monument, the tomb of Philopapus, is a witness to this high status. Now, in my book, it is convenient that Julia Balbilla lives with her brother in Athens. <clears throat> Athens is the backdrop against which Sabina and Julia Balbilla strike up their friendship. While Philopapus takes Hadrian to the Bulauterion, Julia and Sabina roam the Athenian markets in search of slaves and souvenirs and art. And after a morning of doing each their own thing, the couple agree to meet again near the Tower of Winds for lunch, so to speak. The Tower of Winds is situated on the far side of the Roman Agora, where the two ladies go to visit a slave market, much against Sabina's taste. Normally, she leaves it to her servants to take care of such unappealing chores. The visit, however, will have a great impact on her life. While the two women move around, pinching some flesh here, inspecting some teeth there, they suddenly hear the crying of infants. Curiosity drives them to a corner where two castaway twins are lying in a basket. This is an opportunity they can't resist. Julia buys the orphaned twins at once and calls them Alexander and Philomena. <clears throat> and as it goes in novels, she takes good care of them, gives them an excellent education. And when she dies, she bequeaths the twins to her dearest friend, Sabina. These twins, later set free by Sabina, are the most prominent among the few non-historical characters in the book. 
The later Emperor Hadrian has a reputation of being an art lover. In Rome, the Capitoline Museums and also the Palazzo Massimo are filled with statues and mosaics that have been found at Hadrian's villa in Tivoli. Artifacts which the emperor has purchased from everywhere in his empire. So when Sabina is in Athens, she does the shopping. Julia takes her to a first-class art dealer who provides her with first-class sculptures, which will be sent off to Rome. Marble copies from one-time Greek bronzes. Sabina's shopping spree forms the starting point of Hadrian's great art collection. Their stay in Athens also forms the starting point of key relationships for Sabina with Julia and the enslaved twins, Alexander and Philomena. <clears throat> now I've come to the end of my talk through which I hope to have given you a glimpse of the importance that Athens may have had for Sabina. Actually, yesterday we visited the archaeological museum and there was a huge banner on the front of the museum. And you know what it said? It was an, um, it's on an, an exhibition and it said Hadrian and Athens. So I thought, wow. That's good timing. And then I looked at the small letters and it says exhibition started in 2017. And when we went in the museum, we saw that it was apparently still going on, but we could only peek into one room because the rest was closed down. <clears throat> and what did I see in that one room? All male statues. So they forgot about somebody. Anyway, uh, I couldn't see the exhibition, so I shouldn't be so critical be in beforehand, right? Um, okay, I meant to give you a peek into the kitchen of the historic novelist. How with ingredients such as fact, gossip, and some creativity, it is possible to reconstruct an otherwise poorly documented life with, with I hope, some veracity. Also, through a novel such as Sabina, I would like to think that I contribute a wee tiny bit to the reader's historical awareness. And if not every single detail may be true, one thing is definitely true. And this could be another graffiti. For example, I could go to the Tower of Winds tomorrow morning and I could inscribe on it, Sabina was here. Thank you. So, do you want me to invite for questions, or are you going to? Yes. Um, so, if you have questions of whatever nature, I already got questions such as when is the English translation coming out, but can't answer to that unless you have any special connection to a publisher. Um, I'd like to tell you one funny anecdote. Um, when I first had finished the first draft of the book, I showed it to an archaeologist friend and he read it. Uh, I said, please um, look at the archaeological details, make sure I don't make any cardinal mistakes. And he said, oh, it's, it's, it's not bad, it's good, it's okay. One thing he said, you make Sabina buy pottery on the market. You know what I mean, you, yeah. I, to this day, I'm still amazed that, you know, in our studies, Greek and Roman culture, we had to learn all these Greek pots. We could date them to the decennium. So Greece is pottery, but it turns out that the Romans of Hadrian's time did not know about this pottery. It was all destroyed, it was under the surface of the world. So does anybody share this amazement with me or I am, the, am I the most stupid person in the classical <laughs> world? <laughs> I never realized that. So I had to write out the pottery and I wrote in the statues. And of course I have this one coming. Okay, but maybe 
in the meantime, you have thought of some questions. Well, we have one question from our director. Uh -huh. so I will read it from here. I read the book and very much like the description of Sabina's observations on the different houses, palaces and rooms. Also, the descriptions on the clothing are really interesting. And as an archaeologist, I am interested in the materiality of the book. On which basis are the descriptions of the, clo of the clothing? The clothes? Clothing, clothing, the clothing yeah. yes. And the architecture of the environment. In which the story plays? Is it archaeological finds? Is it based on contemporary literature? Is it based on iconography of the time? Or a combination or something else as well? Well, it may be an amalgam. It may be a mixture of all that. Of course, I um, used um, uh, reliefs and uh, books that have uh, port portraits of people from that time. But um, other th things slip into your mind as well. And I'm actually wondering from this question whether um, whether um, she has questions about this um, or whether there's a particular piece of clothing that would not fit into the picture. Um, you don't know because you didn't. Uh, <laughs> so, yeah, so I, uh, I used lots of, uh, I guess we call it secondary literature by archaeologists who have pictures in their books. And I guess that's what I mostly went on. And Sometimes I ask, uh, well, I ask these um, archaeologists about things, and sometimes I may just make things up, maybe. <laughs> but mostly I try to uh, look at uh, pictures in books. Yeah. Yes. Yeah, yeah. Hadrian's Wall, yes. I was wondering if they. She went there with him as well, or was it just named after him and he never went there? Yes, no. Um, Sabina, in my book, she went with Hadrian to Britain and she visited the wall. And actually, uh, when they are uh, camping near the wall, or, or I guess they were, start, they were staying in Eburacum in York, and actually, that's where. Uh, th this um, problem uh, comes up with Suetonius. They're having dinner together, and uh, actually Sabina hates it in England. It's cold, and um, she um, uh, so she starts uh, making jokes and having fun during dinner. And Suetonius happens to be close by, and that's the moment when Hadrian just sort of flips and says, "Now it's enough, you and this Suetonius." But um, yeah, and, and I've uh, described their journey to Britain uh, through Holland because Suetonius, um, he writes about the emperor Caligula. Uh, Caligula uh, has been on the Dutch shore near Katwijk and uh, he was totally mentally ill according to Suetonius and what he did was he told his soldiers to take off their helmets and fill them with shells and um, uh, catapult them towards the sea so he would uh, because he wanted to uh, strike down Poseidon, calm Poseidon and um, so Su uh, Suetonius writes this scene and he is actually on the beach with Sabina because they camp uh, near uh, near uh, Katwijk nowadays, and then they, um, <coughs> so there's another scene with Suetonius where he talks about his own work to Sabina, um, and um, so yeah, I, I tried to make her travel uh, as much as I could, and also tried to tra make the same travels myself, which was uh, possible for Hadrian's Wall and Holland and the Rhine. I haven't been in Central Europe, actually, uh, near the Danube. 
And of course, the Near East is uh, very problematic these days, and that's really a pity for many reasons, but also for not being able to travel there. And I've been in a Egypt, um, and I made her travel a lot with him. And, and she probably did. I mean, it's not made up totally, but we don't know exactly for sure when and when not. Is there anything else I could enlighten you about? Anything you're curious about? Of course you're curious, but you will have to either read in Dutch or in French. Well, thank you so much then for listening to this story and uh, have a nice evening. <laughs>